Okay, so we have got Mandy, and I forgot to make sure that I can pronounce your name right, but I think it's Geiselman, right? That's correct. You got it. Mandy Geiselman. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Mandy Geiselman is a certified OUX strategist from cohort seven, which we were just uh, before the call started realizing that was a year ago. So I haven't actually said Geiselman out loud for an entire year. Um, she's also a senior UX designer at Autodesk. So Mandy started off in the self-paced course. So I kind of knew her from the self-paced course. And then she joined us, like I said, last year in cohort seven. And I just have to say, I was completely blown away um, by Mandy's ability to just pick up on some of the toughest OUX concepts um, so fast. So I just remember thinking as she was going through the course that I definitely need to be learning from this lady and that she is just going to be helping us as a community grow and move OAUX forward. And um, I was just really excited that she agreed to speak at a happy hour. I was like, I don't even care what you talk about. Just like come and teach us and share your mind with us. And then I was very, very excited when she decided to apply this to games because we definitely have that shared interest. Me more on the board games and the card game side. I love to design games um, and Mandy coming from this video game perspective. So uh, Mandy is also interested in cats. We share that as well, uh, as well as with um, Utma. We, we're all cat lovers here and uh, also sea creatures as well. Mandy, what's your favorite sea creature? Like what sea creatures in particular do you love? Uh, I love jellyfish, actually. It's, <gasps> Ooh. Yeah. It's like the bioluminescent ones? Uh, any of them, really. Jellyfish. <laughs> uh, okay. The um, Pacific sea nettle is pretty high up there too. I feel like I need to do a Google image search of that yeah. one. Um, love sea creatures, love octopus. Um, as I was in Croatia recently, I was eating some octopus, which I'm like still feeling guilty about eating octopus. Anyways, Mandy, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let's talk about OUX and games. Alrighty. So I am going to get started. So hi, everyone. Um, as Sophia said, I am my name is Mandy, and I work at Autodesk um, as a senior UX designer uh, working in entertainment and media solutions products. Um, so that, uh, well, that affords me a bit of a insight into the film, games, and TV industry. I'm, I don't work in, in games, so um, this really is an exploratory project around object-oriented gameplay and an exploration into how that um, is applied in Horizon Forbidden West. So like I said, um, this is an exploratory project. Um, it's a discovery into the application of object-oriented UX principles in video games, specifically single-player open-world action role-playing games. Um, and one thing I can safely say after doing this explore study is that this could easily be a larger scale research project. Um, there's so much that I wasn't able to really dive into, um, but there's a lot, uh, a lot there. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail about Games UX specifically. Um, but if you want to learn more, I highly recommend these resources. Um, the Gamer's Brain by Celia Hodent, Game Usability, um, which is a collection of papers and articles edited by Catherine Ipster and Celia Hoden, um, the Games UX Summit, and then a uh, paper called What Is It Like to Be a Game? Object-Oriented Inquiry for Games Research Design and Evaluation by Kate Spiel and Leonard Knack. Um, but in general, um, one thing to know that's important to point out with regards to UX and games is that um, it has different goals uh, than the UX in traditional applications in products. Um, it's not about removing all of the challenges or frustrations. It's about removing the ones that are not by design. Um, so in a game, you're thinking about flow, you're thinking about player experience and making sure that what they're experiencing in the game is by design. So for the uninitiated, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Horizon Forbidden West. 
So Horizon Forbidden West is the second installment in the Horizon series developed by Guerrilla Games and published by Sony Interactive Entertainment. It is an open world single player action role playing game played from a third person perspective. The setting is a post-apocalyptic Western United States, approximately a thousand years after a rogue robot, robot swarm caused a mass extinction event called the Pharaoh Plague. Uh, Project Zero Dawn was developed by scientists across the globe as a way for life on Earth to be reborn after the threat had passed via the AI Gaia and its sub-functions. And humanity repopulated the world, forming tribal societies, each with its own understanding and attitudes towards the old ones, which are the past generation of humans, um, giving the game its signature blend of primitive and futuristic post-apocalyptic aesthetics. So part of the reason I bring this up is that game context is important, so everyone knows um, where I'm coming from, but also it's very important to the nature of a role-playing game. So what is a role-playing game? Um, it is a game that is anchored in a story and a setting, and it's experienced through quests and exploration, which involve combat and character actions that reward items and experience, and subsequently unlock levels and abilities for the player. And these things can impact future combat and character actions that then impact future exploration. So with that in mind, it's not too difficult to see how an RPG is ultimately a virtual world. They have these massive interconnected systems with dozens of affordances, um, and it's a lot to keep track of. And one thing, like what's one thing we can all agree about in the world is that it's full of objects. And game worlds are no different. So how does this relate to object-oriented UX? So in OOUX, we learned that it's a philosophy for designing digital systems that respect the fact that people think in objects and need consistent, recognizable objects to understand an environment or a product. Which reminded me of something that I had read in Celia Hoden's book, The Gamer's Brain, which is that consistency is key. And that if two elements have a similar form, players will expect them to have a similar functionality. So in games, you're interacting with and representing both the actual objects and abstractions of them. So this is kind of what inspired me to explore this connection between object-oriented UX and games. So what are some objects in a game? According to Steve Swink, there are three different kinds of objects in games, each with their own affordances. You have the physical input device. This can be a controller or mouse and keyboard. Um, the virtual avatar, which is usually the player, whether that's you know a race car or an actual uh, humanoid. And then you have the virtual objects that the avatar interacts with. Um, today, we're going to focus more on this third kind of objects and the player's relationship to them. So when first doing some discovery about what the objects are in the Horizon game, um, we can start looking at the map and what are the most important things that are listed on the map. Um, here we can start to see things like waypoints, settlements, rebel camps, cauldrons, ruins. We have handholds, weapons, quests, paths, resources, perks, coils, ammo, skills, outfits, and weaves. And all of these are represented in either abstracted game menus or in the game world. So this is, it can be a lot of objects and this is by no means an exhaustive list and it doesn't even go into the other layered on aspects of a game like photo mode or um, any anything else that doesn't actually relate to the story itself. So, when I was going through this, I was trying to decide what is what is an object versus an object, because there's so many things. You have the things that are explicitly listed in the game. You have domain objects and various objects that populate the game world, and then conceptual objects like quests. So, which ones are the ones that we 
think of in object-oriented UX. Um, and I think it's kind of a trick question because I believe it's all of them. Which led me into this, um, I started noticing this pattern, which led me to this idea of object families. And those are world building versus gameplay objects. So what is world building? World building is the creation of geography, backstory, flora, fauna, and habitants and technology. So it's important to remember that everything that populates a game world, regardless of its degree of interactivity for the player, has to be built and placed and generated into the game. So from a game development perspective, everything in the game world is an object. The type of vegetation that populates a desert environment is going to be different from the types that populate a jungle. And the types of enemies that populate these areas also need to make sense. So for game feel, lore, and impact on playability, the world building objects still have structure, are instantiated, and have a purpose. And they also have relationships with the gameplay objects. So gameplay is um, the pattern defined through game rules, connection between the player and the game, challenges in overcoming them, plot, and the player's connection with it. Gameplay objects are the objects that make a game a game, the things the player interacts with in order to experience or progress through the various aspects of a game. So when we think about world building, this is where we remember an RPG is anchored in a story and a setting. And then in gameplay, these are the ways that the player experiences the story and the setting. Um, and like I said, they have relationships with each other. Um, and in this uh, exploration, I chose to focus more on gameplay objects as those are the ones that players can actually influence and interact with. And you could probably deem as objects with a capital O as we think of them in OOUX. Um, and they are also the things that are likely to re be represented in both a literal and abstract way in the game UI. And they are the most important things to keep consistent from a UX perspective. The other thing I discovered is that um, the player has a relationship with everything. Um, discovery is a huge element of RPG gameplay. Um, there are no abstract representations of an object in game menus for a player to interact with until they have interacted with a literal representation of that object or its container in the game world. So in order for a player to learn all of the details about an object, they first have to discover it. And this is in, the player has a junction object with pretty much everything in the game because you don't want the player to know every single detail about the game from the first moment that they boot it up. And also there's an overlay of information that it really is only relevant when the player is interacting with that object. So with so many potential relationships for the player to have with all of the objects in the game, um, while it isn't all relevant as nested objects or even metadata on the objects themselves, it's part of the player's use data, um, which is important for both game developers and players alike for slightly different reasons. Um, how much of this is surfaced to the player is a decision made by game developers. In the Horizon games, there's a whole statistic screen which gives the players a breakdown as to total machine kills and then which machines um, this is another uh, screen I looked at to start to look at what are some of the objects, the gameplay objects in Horizon as well. So with this very large size of potential gameplay objects, um, I want to focus on the machines. So what are machines? They are the robotic animals that populate the world of Horizon Forbidden West and the entire Horizon universe. Lore-wise, they serve the purpose of fulfilling different tasks associated with the repopulation of all kinds of life on Earth. And they're controlled by the Gaia AI through the subfunction Hephaestus. They are almost exclusively hostile to the player and NPC population due to Gaia's loss of control over Hephaestus. 
um, serving as one of the primary enemies in the game. And gameplay-wise, they contain valuable resources that the player can use to upgrade, purchase, or craft other objects in the game. And through combating these machines, the player increases their experience, unlocking skills, quests, and activities with higher levels of difficulty. But why did I choose machines? Um, so machines show the importance of nested object relationships. They illustrate a tree system. And once defeated, they represent a container object. Um, they show the importance of contextual attribute prioritization that can be leveraged through junction objects. And they are one of the objects in um, the Horizon universe that makes it really unique. So there are two contexts that a player can interact with machine objects. So we're going to start with how machines are represented to a player in the game world. Mandy, the sound's not coming through, but I think that's okay, right? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So we think about the machine um, tree system. This is an example of a machine instance of the fruit. Um, and you can start to see how attributes are represented in contextual manners um, and that the prioritization in the game world is focused on the center of the screen. And that there are attributes that are only relative to that specific relationship, things like hit points remaining, whether or not there's an elemental state applied to it. Um, and there's also the importance of things like sound effects and dialogue. Overall, these belong in kind of their game feel attributes. Um, and that's something that we typically don't have to think about in um, traditional products and applications, um, but they do have a significant impact on player experience. So next we're going to look at what is the machine's what are, how are machines represented in menu screens or in this case in the notebook, which is the collection of all of the things um, of the primary objects that a player has interacted with that um, are in some, it's, it's like a roster keeping track of all of the different things you've discovered and people you've discovered. So this is where you start to see um, the card list and detail views start to become more apparent. Um, at a very high level, we can see that relationships are illustrated um, as a machine has one to many variants, um, a machine variant has one to many machine parts, and a machine part contains one to many resources. Um, and so that's that's where we start to see this tree system is you have the root and then you have the variant, which is the branch. And then the instance is the fruit with that the player interacts with in the game. And where I see the power of nested objects in games, um, it isn't always about contextually navigating to the related object, but bringing the related object to the context that the player is in. Um, cause the player doesn't have to access or doesn't always have access to the detail page because it might be something that's only accessible if the item is in, it's in, in their inventory. 
or they haven't discovered it yet. So at a very high level, this is what the object map starts to look like for machines and their related objects. And again, this is by no means exhaustive or all inclusive. Um, it's just the most clearly represented attributes and relationships. Um, and there are attributes that are important to game mechanics and game feel that um, I didn't mention here, mostly because I don't have that kind of insight. Um, so again, like two of the most apparent benefits here um, are the focus on prioritization and the power of leveraging nested objects to keep players immersed in the game. Um, because the goal is for players not to be navigating through menus, that's not gameplay, um, it's to play the game. And you'll notice that there don't seem to be many CTAs. Um, and that partially goes back to this idea of the input object. So for PlayStation, it's the controller. And this is the way the player interfaces with the game. And that's all done through direct manipulation. Um, the DualShock controller has approximately 19 different buttons and manipulators. Um, and the actions a player can take on objects are mapped to a button or combination of multiple buttons on the controller. Um, so a player, yes, they can attack a machine, but there are many, many ways that they can do that that are related to the skills the player develops as they progress through the game. And I think that how CTAs can be documented using OUX practice could probably be its own discussion, um, but there's quite a bit of um, information around controllers and muscle memory, ergonomics, human attention span, and all of that related to the input device that um, I think it's worth looking into if you are um, interested. So with that, we're going to actually hop into the whimsical. So here we start to see our core tree system, which is the machine root, um, the machine variant, and then the machine instance. Um, and then we have the machine instance and player relationship. So while the machine instance doesn't appear to have very many attributes, it's mostly because this relationship with the player and all of these attributes that a machine can have can only be added to or inflicted upon the machine by the player. Um, and ultimately the types of resources that that machine rewards are dependent on the way in which the player defeats that machine. When looking at machine parts, which is another tree system inside of machines, um, it's a two-parter. So we have the machine part root, um, which has um, its own set of attributes that are literally called attributes in the game. Um, and then there's quite a few multi-way relationships. So we have machine part root, machine variant branch and resource root. An attribute of that is the resource obtainment likelihood. Um, Cause while you might have the same machine part on multiple machines, um, depending on its variant, it um, has a different obtainment likelihood. And then there's, again, relationship between the machine part and the player, and then the machine part and the machine instance in the player. Um, the same with resources. Um, so we have your resource root and your resource fruit. Um, and most of the attributes for the fruit are actually um, on the relationship it has with the player. Um, it, I kind of think of it like money. Once you've collected, you know, if you have $5 from Venmo and you're, then you have your paycheck, you're not going to go pay for something and say, I want $2 from this transaction and $3 from this transaction. So it all kind of goes into the root. And what you really need to know in your inventory is how many you have, but 
you're not looking at the individual instances of that resource. Um, and then these are a couple of less fleshed out objects that are related to um, machines that just helped fully flesh out what their object maps kind of looked like. So looking at this in context, we start to see a player has zero to many machines root that they have discovered. So we have their list view. Um, a machine has, whether or not it's been discovered by the player, it shows whether or not an icon even appears here and whether or not information even shows up. Um, so the prioritization follows like this, um, and we can see that directly represented. Um, and then we have the child machine variants here. Visually, the image seems like it's lowest priority, but if you really think about it, the, the 3D model kind of has to exist first. So um, it's a little difficult to know what priority this image should be. Um, but ultimately, that's this is the way that they chose to lay out and um, I think they've done a pretty good job. Um, so when we go into machine variant, um, you'll notice I started to uh, really break out which of these highest priority objects were inherited inside of these roots um, and inside of these nested objects, uh, mostly because we're not linking players to these objects, we're bringing that information to the player in this context. Um, so here's most of the information is just about the variant, but then a machine has one to many machine parts. And the way that you navigate through your um, the player is able to go through and see the position on the machine of where all of these parts are, what their descriptions are, and what kind of loot it has, what its attributes are. Um, and then when you uh, inspect the loot for a specific machine part, it brings in all of the information about that resource. Um, here into the screen. So you're not navigating to a completely different area of uh, menus. It's bringing everything that the player needs to know about all of the attributes and aspects of this machine into this context. And then again, here's where we start to see that percentage uh, likelihood. And when we start to look at this in the context of the game world and how this prioritization is inherited in the machine instance. Um, there's a concept in games called level of detail, and it's a progressive disclosure in a way. Um, so how much information do I need to know about an object from however far away I am from that object? So while in this screenshot, you can clearly see the machine, when you're far enough away, you're looking at it from a map possibly. And until you get close enough, you might see it in your um, immediate vicinity kind of um, compass map, mini map. And what Horizon has is they employ a, a mechanic called the focus and this is a way for you to inspect and overlay that additional information about um, the machine or object to um, learn more about it um, without having to go into those menu screens. Um, so when a player engages the focus mode, they can see the health bar before they've actually engaged with the machine. Um, it has um, when you autom when you enter into this mode, it automatically gives you the most relevant information about the machine variant, whether or not you can override it, um, and then to navigate between all the machine parts, 
those are represented in the reticle. Um, and you navigate through those using the same button mapping as you do in these menu screens, um, which is very nice. And when you navigate to the other uh, machine part, it's updating the icon. It's telling you the most relevant information about its attributes as to whether or not it's detachable and what kind of, um, does it contain valuable resources and um, what benefits does it have if you remove it? Um, you can also see this focus mode and highlights other objects in the game. Um, and you might notice that this seems like fewer machine parts um, than what we saw in the menus. And that's because these are the actual detachable machine parts. So things that if a player were to not detach them before defeating the machine, anything that they contain would be destroyed. So for this machine instance player relationship, in addition to the things I, I just reviewed, we have um, its status, whether it's calm, alert, or aware, and its state. And so status and state are clearly indicated. So this is constantly um, shown as you engage with the machine as to whether or not you've been noticed or um, if it's calm or alert. Um, and then if you have applied a elemental state to it and um, it gives you a timer for how long that is happening, while this stays in the center of your screen, this information stays relative to the machine's health bar. And something else that is important to note, because in games you're not always wanting to put this abstracted layer on top, because it's something that a player has to recognize. Um, there are ways that you can employ this information uh, natively or diegetically. Uh, so you can see that there's an elemental corrosion state applied to this machine because it's covered in this green slime. And I can tell that it's alert because its eyes are now red instead of the blue that you can see in this screen. And then once you've defeated a machine, um, it turns into a sort of container object um, where again, we see the icon, we see the name. So this prioritization has trickled down through all of these different um, applications of how we're interacting with this thunder jaw. And then now I get to see these are the actual resources that I received from this machine upon defeating it and given the opportunity to um, take one or, or many of them. Um, additionally, where we see this uh, rarity when you're looking at a machine or a resource cache from afar, you have a um, an icon for resources that are more for upgrades and then you have resources that are for uh, crafting and potions and stuff. And um, the rarity of the most rare object that is in this container is then visualized in the um, icon overlay for that object so that the player can make the conscious decision. Okay, I know I don't wanna leave this behind because this contains something that's really valuable um, versus if this was gray, it's more likely to just contain metal shards and it's up to the player as to whether or not they actually want to engage with that object and take those items. For the most part, um, this is really where I saw the most, e it was most easily applicable to um, kind of expressing how nested object relationships and prioritization can really be used and influenced, um, can influence game design um, and making sure that players are receiving the right information in the context that they need without being burdened into going into all of these different sub menus to find the relevant information um, for the context that they're in. Do you have any questions or comments or anything? I haven't been looking at the Thank chat. Thank you, Mandy. Yay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was so interesting. Um, I'm going to take us back to, to myself, back to gallery view. That was really cool. There was a lot in the chat about, yes, 
Yay. Um, about how in depth this was. Um, and I have a few questions. Um, I'll go ahead and start asking my questions. Um, and then feel free to put any other questions in the chat. But my my big question is, well, it's more of a, a clarity thing. So we've got the machine, right? The kind of root machine. And then we have these, we have variants. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then, which is almost like, to me, would be more like an, ah, uh, it's like, does every machine, is it one, is it have at least one variant? Like, yeah. is there like, so is that more like an object base? And then we have variants are like the derived objects. So um, I thought about, I thought about all of these different ways. I was like, is it a nested local object? Is it, you know, an object base? And um uh the the thing is that it does have unique attributes so a thunder jaw does have different values for those attributes than a um another machine might have and these various machines do um originate from different cauldrons um i chose to make them in a tree system because i thought of these more as like genus and species Mm -hmm. than um, something that was like an object base. But it's definitely like the making it an object base is probably just as valid. Um, it's, it's so, you know, we have yeah. all these tools, right? In OUX, mm -hmm. these junction objects, the tree systems to kind of like to break this stuff down. And I, I guess like my main question is, so you use this to you use OUX to kind of reverse engineer this game so that you mm -hmm. could show us this, right? Um, I'm curious, like, did this help you understand the game any better? Oh, I yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, once once you start to read about UX and games in general, you start to see the patterns. Um, but this, um, it does start to... I mean, I've played this game a lot and I was still learning things about the relationships as I was asking questions about, okay, so what if I'm, you know, things like with outfits when I was, I was exploring things like outfits and weapons for a period and you can apply a look from another outfit to your current outfit so that you can look different than what you're actually wearing if you like a certain aesthetic. It's like, well, does that persist regardless of what outfit that you have equipped or is it only on that one? Um, so these are things that I didn't really explore when I was playing it, but learning about it and thinking through it critically was able to, um, start to see and just how much detail and how many decisions are made that go into games is fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm reading, uh, the Dungeon Crawler Carl series now, which is a lit RPG, and it's so complicated. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if I had an object map of this book, it would make it so much easier to follow this book. So, and just for, for everybody here, like I think there is these two great ways to use the or this this mapping system of Orca and object map and nested objects and all these fun things. It's like this can help you understand an existing thing. So whether that is in an existing system that you are just, you're being dropped into as a consultant or you're starting at a new company or you're in B2B and things you're just like, like shit's just really complex. Like you can just OUX the current state, like not even worry about design it, just, just OUX it so that you can understand it better as like a way of breaking down something. And then it can also be used then to design it. And I just wonder like, I mean, I know folks are using OUX for VR, but like for game design, like that would be, I wonder what it would have been like for these designers to make the object map first mm -hmm. before to <laughs> actually design the game. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying. It, it could easily be a like larger research project where you can go in and like actually try and make a game, a video game using an object map um something that uh you know things that you don't really think about either um uh, like doors in games whether or not you can go through a door or not a door that can be open needs to look different from a door that can't be opened and so even getting into attributes in a model or a 3d model can 
or like these things do impact gameplay and player experience and documenting what those are like it it can only help with communication across an entire team i think so yeah yeah definitely um and making it clear with those tree systems like this is just this is just the the template for the thing Mm -hmm. and this is like the one that you defeated yesterday and this is the one that you're like fighting right now and they actually have different properties yeah um so richard's asking how does the object math relate to the developers object models um manny can you speak i mean can you speak to that at all or for this game or even from an autodesk perspective um Um, i think that there's there's similarities and there's difference differences. I think object models for developers tend to have more objects in them than we usually have to deal with as UXers. Um, that's that is one of the the struggles though with especially games when you're thinking about well somebody has to build this and it has to look consistent and you're thinking about how much memory a, a game takes up and like. There are a lot of things that look exactly the same, but that's just because the player actually doesn't interface with it. They interface with it by proxy. Um, But um, that it's easy to start to think about all of these multitudes of objects. But in general, I feel like even in this application, a developer would probably have more. Um, Yeah, but I'm just even thinking like having that object map, like I'm like, how did the how did the game designers, I don't know, this is my problem because I'm so deep in OEX. I'm like, how do they do it without? (laughs) Like this, like how do they track (laughs) all of these things, like all the attributes that pop and like all the dependencies and the attributes and like what was the one that you were mentioning, the percent, the percent likelihood that you're gonna find the thing. And uh, there's so much to these RPGs and so much complexity. Like what, yeah. are the, what, what do the maps look like? <laughs> I, I'm really curious because I know that like they, all of these game studios have to have some sort of system in place or else it, you know, they wouldn't be able to develop such incredible high, com- highly complex games. Um, mm-hmm. But it is, it would be very interesting to see what they're actually doing. Right. Um, Steven's asking, um, what tools would you, Stephen? What are you talking about? What, what tools do you recommend for game design or for OEUX? Any tool? Any 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 tool? Oh, well, uh, Autodesk. <laughs> People use Autodesk for game design, right? Or is it? Yeah, they use it. They they can use um the three D modeling software. Yeah, most game studios use either um some sort of three D modeling software whether or not it's Autodesk or Blender or anything else, yeah. Um, and then Kristen, did you discover any of the OUX danger zones in your exploration? Ah, yeah, like mass objects, isolated objects, shapeshifters, or do you feel like they, they did a pretty good job of avoiding this? I mean, you were mentioning the door, like the door that you mm-hmm. can go through versus the door that you can't go through, like they should look different. Did you find anything else? Um, there, like I said, there are some things that look the diff look different or are different but look the same um and but that is only for objects that like i said aren't actually physically represented in the game world the player never actually sees some of the resources they never act they never actually see that resource so you only ever see the icon so when you're in these game menus they have chosen an image that's representative of a machine part. And that machine part image is like on every single machine part icon. So that image isn't changing, but the information about it is. So the abstraction of it is consistent, whether or not the physical representation of it is different um, is really relative to whether or not it matters. Like you're not going to waste all of that memory space that's very valuable in games. Games can be like hundreds of gigabytes. So you're not going to create a bunch of different 3D models to represent different things if the player's never going to actually need to tell the difference between them in the game world. I mean, I wonder just philosophically how much, like it's, it's, 
it's easier for those those UX fails that we talk about in OUX to get in with something like a screen design and an interface versus a, a game because the game is supposed to be to a certain extent you do have to uh, follow the laws of physics yeah or some sort of physics like it's it, because it wouldn't it would like be so silly right it's just like in the mm-hmm. real world we, we like I joke all the time like shapeshifters and mass objects in the real world are hilarious like mm-hmm. the 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 picture that um of the the, the the cooking spray and the insect uh and the insect killer that's like a, the exact same it's like the same right. brand. it looks exactly the same like we laugh at that because we're like it's two very different things in the same freaking packaging you would never do that in the real world and the game design it's like almost the real world right mm-hmm. and then we go into these screens and it's so much more abstracted it's just so easy to just like not even think about that and not and just break the laws of physics so I'm guessing games in general, at least video games, do much better job with that. Um, I, yeah, I think they have to. I mean, these yeah. are these, um, you know, one of the things about, especially with RPGs, is that even the way you design quests, even the, the way you design weapons, they all have to make sense of the story you're trying to tell and the context you're trying to tell. Um, so it wouldn't make sense for the most part to like, have pistols in horizon that's not the what the story is about that's not the story that they're trying to tell so um everything has to make sense inside of that game world and um it has to abide by some sort of some sort of laws that make sense it has to make sense um yeah yeah and then to have something like a resource and a machine like Mm -hmm. look the same or something like yeah just, you wouldn't do that in the game right but no. then maybe in the interface on top of the game like you could but it seems like they did a really good job yeah the, I think uh, part of why I chose Horizon is because I think they actually did a pretty good job and it's a lot easier to talk about it when people do a good job and it's you know doesn't um you don't get too stuck in in the critique and you get more into actually seeing the the focus I mean even when you when I show the difference between like a plant resource versus like a machine resource, like one has a triangular icon with leaves and one's a square icon with a cube inside. And so even from far away, you can start to see these things. And like another point in games is that you're as a player, I mean, from the clip you saw of that combat scenario, you don't have a lot of time. So everything has to be really easily recognizable and quickly recognizable. Um, so a lot of times when you get into a game, you if you know they've achieved their goals, you're not thinking about the interface at all. You're just recognizing and acting. And so- Muscle memory, the muscle yeah, memory. So you're um, having to, like that is all by design. And so in doing this project, it actually forced me to take time and think about what are all of the thoughts that I am thinking right now as I engage in this um in this scenario right Mm, yeah I mean that comes back to like that oh my gosh there's so much interesting stuff here I go like I know we're over time now but like the the friction right so like there's certain friction that you want in games right like you like you want a certain amount of cognitive load in the right spot and then and but when it comes to like oh my gosh that that friction of muscle memory like you don't and and so much in UX, like we have to, we can't use our muscle memory mm-hmm. because things change places on us. Like I just found another, I found a masked CTA in Spotify the other day where the same exact plus sign was used. You can either, if you're in a playlist or if you're in, you want to add to a playlist and you use the same plus sign, but then if you're in another view, then it's adding it to your like songs, the same exact plus button. And so like, yeah, you have to, you have to think so much. Usually you can't use that muscle memory. The things like are not in the same place. Um, yeah. Like you said, that's a whole other rabbit hole about mm-hmm. muscle memory and how we can give people more muscle memory and, and stuff that we're designing. Um, I just want to read one thing real quick. Richard said that you've made me want to go and reverse OUX some board games and then try and develop a new board game starting with the worker process. Me too. <laughs> like how much fun would that be? Yeah. Um, and and, and the, the game that I have, which I'm going to someday, I'm going to re-release it, Crosslinked, which is a game, a card game for learning OEUX. 
I owe you much to that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's really fun. I want to, I want to owe you some game instructions because game instructions, yeah. especially board game instructions are so bad. Yeah. Um, and because they're very procedural, they're, they just give you all the procedures. And I don't feel like they're really good at showing you, okay, here's all the things in the game. Let's just define all the things. Here's how those things relate to each other here's what you can do to them as a player and here's our general attributes like now let's go to the procedures i think that like oeux and game direction so that you understand your o's your r's your c's and your a's before you get into the procedures be really interesting i also think object-oriented ux with even like video game onboarding and tutorials can help because you're also prioritizing the objects in your game what are the most important objects the player needs to know now versus later and what are the most important attributes of that now versus later? What do I need to surface to the player when they're getting started versus something that I can surface through that they can discover later through exploration or can be surfaced later when they have more of a handle on, on the game world too now? Yeah. yeah, 100%. I mean, the, the, the way that games on board do so much, usually do so much better than the way that we on board and um and onboarding through that is yeah like what are the ob what objects make the most sense right now what do you need to get started right all right wonderful thank you so much mandy oh, thank um, you cheers everybody i'm going to paste one more time nope i'm not going to paste one more time i'm going to paste one more time the da, 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 the you know what that 100 dollars off code for the self-paced master class or the certification, you can go to ouxcom slash masterclass, ouxcom slash certification. Certification isn't up yet. You got to wait till Monday for that. Um, right. Cheers. Thank Everybody. you, everyone. Happy, happy OUXing. Bye. Bye.